is essentially a function that to any state in the Hilbert space, to any vector, associates a complex number. And I gave for you an example. For instance, if you take uh, uh, this object here, you fix any psi, okay, fix psi in the Hilbert space. And then you consider this object here, okay? Then this object is obviously a function of the psi of the p with precisely the uh, linear function with precisely the property that the linear function should have, thanks to the linearity of the scalar product. Right? And then I told you that there is a theorem which is somehow the inverse of this that says that given any linear function, okay, so this is an example, but given any linear function r, then a psi exists, okay? So for any p that we can think of, linear function, a, a psi exists such that, okay, p of p is equal essentially to psi p, okay? So this way of writing is essentially exhaust all possibilities, okay? It's not only an example, but any fa linear function you can think of there is a bra waiting for the vector to come in and produce a number. Okay, that's the meaning of the bra. Linear function. Very good. Uh, remember that these are linear functions and, 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 and I can co combine them together. I discussed last time. You can form, for instance, if I have F1 and F2, okay? I can form alpha one F1 plus alpha two F2. This object can be given the meaning of a linear function. How does it act on a state P? Well, nothing but alpha one P1 P plus alpha two P2 P, right? Alpha one and alpha two, I remind you, are complex numbers, okay? Now, you realize that this object is associated to some psi one, right? So this object here is in fact, you see, psi one p. This object here is associated uniquely to a psi two. In other words, the, what you have here is p two psi. Huh? Careful, however, this object here is not associated to alpha one psi one plus alpha two psi two, but rather to alpha one star psi one plus alpha two star psi two. Okay. In other words, this object here, if you put the alphas inside here, the bra, remember that you should put a star hmm? so that when uh, you, you, you calculate the scalar product by just uh, doing the usual things, you get down uh, the correct alpha one and alpha two. Okay, this is the only slight complication of this part. Because remember, the scalar products have the property that on the left, if you act on the left, um, there are stars. Okay, good. Now, this, in some sense, uh, clarifies or uh, hopefully clarifies the meaning of the uh, bra. Okay, good. Now let us move again to linear operators. Now I'm talking of operators, not of functions. So things that take a vector and produce another vector. Mm -hmm. For a moment, let's assume that H is finite dimensional, okay? As I told you, very often Hilbert spaces are infinite dimensional constant. But suppose that they are finite dimensional. What does it mean? It means that there exists a basis. So exists some basis of states, let me call it uj, okay? With j equal to one to n, this means being say n dimensional, okay? Such that any state, any phi, okay, can be written as a sum 
of these vectors u j okay for j equal to one to n with some appropriate coefficient let me call pj obviously you change the state the coefficient will change right now you see immediately that these are these are complex numbers good so you see that essentially here i have uh, made a, a connection between a state in the Hilbert space finite dimensional uh, with a column vector p1 p2 pn sorry of complex numbers okay so that's an element of c to the power n right the example i gave last time as a possible Hilbert space so you see that essentially any finite dimension of Hilbert space can be identified. Mathematicians would say it's isomorphic, but I mean you can think of it once you fix a basis to C to the N. Okay, so it's the same, essentially the same thing. Good. So this is something that you very often do. You write vectors as column vectors. And you write operators as matrices. Okay, what's the idea behind it? It's very, very simple. The idea is the following I take now an operator A. You know that this is a linear operator, which means that if I specify the axial of it on any element of the basis, I do have a complete description by linearity of the action of A, right? You remember this from linear algebra, very, very straight linear algebra. Okay, so let me uh, specify what A does on the state uj, hmm? on the vector uj. Well, we produce some combination of basis vectors. Okay, so some sum over j prime. I have to use another uh, symbol from one to n of uj prime, and the coefficients are numbers that depends on the j i fixed and the j prime that i have there okay let me call them a j prime j okay these are numbers complex numbers okay which should depend on these two indices on j prime i am summing j is this number here is it clear good the reason why i write it in this order and not in the opposite is the following suppose that i take now the scalar product of this object with an element say uh, u j second okay let's do the following calculation i take a u j okay and i take the scalar product with the, this u j second okay then according to uh, this way of writing, this is the sum by linearity, which is sum over j prime from one to n of a j prime j, and then I have u j second u j prime. Okay. But this I've assumed that this is an orthonormal. Sorry, maybe I didn't stress it. This is an orthonormal basis. Whenever you select a basis, you better choose it to be normalized vectors and orthogonal according to the scalar product. Otherwise, the algebra is mess. Okay. But you can always do that with a process of orthogonalization if you want. Okay. Now, this means that this object is delta j prime j second. Okay. So in some sense, in this sum here, what I have is only the j second term. So this is equal to a j second j. Okay. So very clearly, you see that the sandwich of a in between the state j and the state j second is precise, precisely the element that I put there. Okay. So that's the reason for the order you see j second to the left j to the right j second to the left j to the right okay so as a matrix index i i mean i use exactly the same thing 
of the sandwich. Okay, good. So every operator can be written as a column vector. Oh, by the way, let's use the script here. Okay, so let's calculate the scalar product. Okay. Uh, with u j second t. Okay, then I have the sum over j from so one to n of t j, and then I have the scalar product of u j second u j. This is again a delta. Okay, so the result is that this is equal to t j second. Okay, so you see that the Component okay of uh, the element uh, on a given uh, basis is precisely given by the, the scalar product okay of the uh, vector phi with the corresponding element of the basis okay which is exactly what you do when you express a vector in three dimensions say in uh, Cartesian components okay you calculate the component by taking the scalar product. Uh, with the vector of the vector with the basis element. Is it clear? Okay, this is exactly the same thing. Okay, and it works not only for vectors, it also works for operators. Okay, so operators can be written as matrices where the elements that appear here are just the sandwich of the operator in between the two basis element states. Is it clear? Good. Let's. Uh, um, Let's see. Now, uh, this is the element of the basis, and this is the action of A on an element of the basis. What about the action of A on a state psi? Psi is now a combination. Okay. No, sorry, on a state phi, which is now a combination of this element. Okay. So let's do it. So this is equal to A acting on. The sum here by linearity, let me write it immediately as sum of j to one to n of phi j a acting on the element of the basis, right? Good, but this I know what it is, right? Is the sum over j prime. So this is equal to the sum over j, the sum over j prime, okay? And then I have. Uh, let's put this object here. I first put the a j prime j, and then I put here the phi j prime immediately, phi j immediately after. Okay, and then I have uh, this element here. So u j prime. Okay, very good. So this is an operator acting on a state. Okay, which means is a vector. Let me call the vector psi. Okay, so it's the vector that you obtain by applying the operator to p. Mm. Now, any any uh, uh, vector c can be written in components. So I can write this uh, sum over uh, psi j u j. Okay, and in order to facilitate your reading this formula, so this would be j from one to n. Let's call the index j prime. It's the same. I mean, this, these are called dummy indices. So they, I mean, they're they are ju just used in the sum. Okay, so you can change the name as you wish. Okay. If you do that, you immediately realize that this object here, okay, is in fact equal to this object here. You see? So in other words. This equation here, the vectorial equation psi equal to the operator A applied to the other vector C, really means in components that psi j prime, okay, let me write it uh, as in the notes, so that I, okay, psi j prime is equal to the sum over j from one to n of the matrix element j prime j of the operator a times pj which is the component of phi 
on the basis element. Okay, so you see that this is a typical matrix equation. Matrix vector gives you a vector, right? As you do for ordinary matrices. Okay, and indeed these are ordinary matrices, finite dimensional things. Okay, so you see that once you suppose that your Hilbert space is finite dimensional, quantum mechanics is a game of linear algebra of complex linear of essentially play in this space. Okay. You have the vectors given by column vector, the operators given given by matrices, complex matrices. Mm -hmm. Clear? Good. So you realize fixing a basis is the procedure that allows you to work with ordinary vectors, somehow ordinary column vectors and ordinary matrices. Mm -hmm. uh, now, so far, I assume that this was five dimensions. But indeed, the trick works in principle even for an infinite dimension of hyperspace. Okay, although I realize with you a certain difficulty in picturing, uh, well, infinite dimensional vector you could think of uh, a row that goes forever, but an infinite dimensional matrix means a really even more complex thing to imagine. But never mind, you could think that all this procedure here would actually be well defined for infinite dimensional objects with some delicacies, how things are well defined, blah, blah, blah. But this is for mathematicians, okay? Which we need. Give me, let's, let me give you one example. We already did the harmonic oscillator, okay? And you remember that there are states PM, okay, of the harmonic oscillator that are eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, okay? With n going from 0, 1, 2, up to infinity. Okay, remember an, an infinite tower or harmonic oscillator eigenstate. Very good. This you could think of as the state uj that I got there. Okay, so uh, this uh, let's call un. This is the basis. Okay, so I use this basis to express everything in my Hilbert space. The vectors will be given by components into the state. By the way, what they are, you know very well that these are essentially Hermit polynomial. Okay, these are Hermit polynomial times e to the minus x square over twice the oscillator length square. Remember that x should always be thought as dimensionless, if you want to write things like this, times some normalization constant, one over square root of n plus four. Okay, so these are states in the Hilbert space. And you can think of them as basis states, which means that any function, okay, can be in principle expanded into the circuit. Gaussian's time summit polynomial. Okay, and therefore you uniquely associate the function with a, an infinite row uh, column vector of numbers, which tells me how much I do have of every possible state. Mm -hmm. Good. And in fact, you could think that not only vectors are uniquely defined, as I told you, but matrices also, operators. Mm -hmm. So if I have the operator X, for instance, you remember what X was, right? X was, well, X over L. So L divided by square root of two, A plus A double, okay? So please try to verify. You remember how A and A double act on the state of the harmonic oscillator. They increase N by one or decrease N by one, right? So try to calculate the matrix X associated to the operator X. It would be a matrix N prime, N, okay, or J prime, J, as you wish, which in principle, okay, you might think of writing, although it's infinite dimensional, okay? So try to start writing. And you will see that we have zero almost everywhere, except that, here in the two uh, diagonals, you will have simple numbers, okay? 
because for every L you are connected to the next state and the previous one. The next one by a diagram, the previous one by a. Okay, so you can write this matrix. There will be square root of things. Huh? And you write the matrix correct. And you will do the same for P. P is uh, one over square root of two I with the appropriate uh, um, H bar over L, if you remember. Huh? And then I have A minus K bar. And again, P would have a similar form, the matrix for P. Okay, good. Infinite dimensional with elements. Ah, now, Believe it or not, if you do the commutator of these two infinite dimensional matrices, what you get is that X commutator P is equal to I H bar, an infinite dimensional matrix of one in the diagonal. Okay. This is in, this again is in fact what Heisenberg did at the beginning. So he worked with the matrix formulation of quantum mechanics. Okay, so you realize that you have to associate matrices to observables huh? rather than okay. Now that I've given you this abstract formulation, you realize how from an abstract formulation you go to a matrix, and therefore uh, Heisenberg and uh, quantum mechanics is one way of of looking at at the uh, quantum mechanical formula. Okay. Yeah. Oh, just the chronicle there. Uh, um, uh, you know, make the summing. I mean, the, the index indices, how the indices uh, interact with each other. Uh, no, I have to sum over J prime, right? But this delta restricts the sum to having simply J second. So I get J second. Sorry, he, this is a comma. Okay, uh, sometimes I skip the comma, but I better skip. Okay. So it doesn't matter uh, for the it doesn't matter how the. Uh, oh, it doesn't uh, absolutely matter. I mean, this is a delta even if you say little, but in any case, I mean, ah, yes. Sorry. Yes, this is equal to delta J second J prime. I was okay. assuming this. Uh, no, you know, that's not really no. I mean, something that is one or zero, depending if the two indices are the same, no matter what, how do you write them, or okay. There is an issue that you might say, hey, what about uh, Dirac's delta? What about uh, continuum? A bit more in the lab, uh, later uh, part of the lecture, okay, on this. Clear so far? Yeah. So the matrix formulation comes directly from working in a basis, yes. Which one? The X, the X operation. Uh, yeah. The X, um, yeah. Uh -huh. okay. So the amount of the coming when you can return to the X or X. Okay, let me. Let, yeah, okay. I, I don't know if I understood your question, but let me be explicit on what I mean by the string. Okay. So, so I'll do that for you. So according to my prescription, I told you that the matrix, okay, uh, say in prime, I'm using N rather than J now because uh, we call the eigenstate with the N, okay? But it's the same thing. This is equal to phi N prime or U, okay? As you wish, the eigenstate that we started for the harmonic oscillator. And then I have here X, the operator. The operator is L, the oscillator length divided by square root of two a plus a delta. Okay, mm. apply to phi. Okay, now you remember that if you apply this, you get phi n minus one with a square root of n. If you apply this, you get phi n plus one with the square root of n plus one. Okay, so this object here is equal to phi n prime. So let me put L over square root of two in front. Uh, with um, what? I have square root of N 
times phi n minus one. And to be honest, the square root of n, I might put it. So let me put the square root of n here in front. And in this way, I have a simple phi n minus one here, plus square root of n plus one uh, times phi n prime phi n plus one. Okay. Now I use the fact that these are orthogonal, and therefore this will give me a contribution only. Here I use the delta, the Kronecker delta, only if n prime is equal to n minus one. And this will give me a contribution only if n prime is equal to n plus one. Okay. And if you if you think of this and you start writing element zero zero element uh, one one element two two and then element zero one. I'm starting from zero, sorry. Usually you start from one, but you understand. I mean, you, you, you could change if you want to think. So if you start looking at things, you realize that the only non vanishing elements are in the two, um, uh, not diagonal, how it's called, uh, the element above the diagonal and below the diagonal. Okay? And all the other terms are zero. Everything that is zero, zero. Okay, zero. So the only two rows of numbers just above and just below the, the diagonal are present. And these numbers are the square root, okay, of uh, the increasing number. Hmm? That's the, the matrix that we will construct. And similarly for P. And then you do, in principle, a commutator of these two very, very large infinitely dimensional matrices, then you get one in the diagonal. Okay, this is Heisenberg formulation of quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, can I close this uh, chapter? Okay, good. Now, uh, with uh, the uh, things we said about uh, the uh, functionals and the meaning of the bra in mind. Okay, let's return to this story. I will now define for you the adjoint operator in a better way or in a slightly more formal way. Okay, so suppose that I have an operator A. Okay, then I can form for you certainly things like uh, A, you apply to phi, and then you take the star product with psi. Okay, now this is uh, a, uh, an object, okay, which uh, I might use in this way. Let us let us associate, okay, to this A here, an operator, okay, which does the following. This operator is called A dagger, such that this object here is identical to an operator A adjoint acting on the bra state applied to the field. Okay, so in other words, what is the operator that when acting on the bra, which is the state that does accept vector phi, will produce exactly the same result as the action of A on phi, and then taking psi as, um, as, as a bra. Okay, so this is in some sense the definition of this object here. Okay, so it's the operator that you have to apply to the psi to the bright element in order for this equality to hold. Is it clear? Okay, now we have seen in many cases in practice, okay, but in principle, this is the definition. Okay, now you realize that if A is a mission, if A is a mission, by definition of a mission, it means that A dagger is equal to a okay so a can pass to the left and to the right without any uh, difficulty okay 
So the definition of Hermitianity is when the Hermitian conjugate coincides with the element. Now, Hermitian operators are particularly uh, important. They have essentially two uh, important properties. Mm. Ah, by the way, for an Hermitian operator, okay, I have that this equality reads in the following way. Okay, I rewrite it equal to A psi two, right? Because A is equal to A double. But you know that one of the properties of the scalar product is that you can invert the two things, right? So this is equal to P A psi. Well, with what? With a star. Okay, good. So emission operators have this property that if you exchange the two vectors which appear in this expression, you get the star. Okay. In particular, this tells you property A of the emission operator is that the diagonal elements, okay, so something like P A P is by necessity real. Okay. Uh, by the way, you see that I sometimes write here an extra bar, but this is the, you should think of it in the same way as like this. Okay. So it's the same thing. It's just I mean, two possible notation for the same object. If I have the same object, I can exchange it. I get the star, but therefore the star has to be equal to the object, which means it is real. Okay. So I mean, the proof is elementary. Second thing, this is very important, this is called the spectral theorem. Spectral theorem. It tells you that there exists a complete, exists a, let me write it as complete basis. Uh, when I say basis, that means complete, so you can express anything, okay? Of uh, of eigenvectors of the operator A, if it's A version, which somehow is the basis of the space. Mm -hmm. So you can express any element in the space in terms of eigenvectors of A. They form a basis. Okay, this is something that we already use sometimes, for instance, for the Hamiltonian. We saw that is true. Yeah. Um, for the A for the P, uh, is it only for the case of phi and phi, not phi and psi? Of course, only for phi and phi. In general, phi and psi is complex. Mm -hmm. But if the two things are the same, one line proof, just put phi and phi here, phi phi equal to phi phi psi. Okay. Mm -hmm. So only if the two are the same. Uh, also I want to ask about the basis. Yeah. So basically, we are, uh, until now, we are talking about like extra basis. We haven't, uh, like, we haven't, uh, like, example in basis. So, how do you, is it like, no, there is the reason why I'm doing this lecture now and not at the beginning uh -huh. is because you now have examples in mind that you could think. For instance, Let's think of the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator. Okay. I have a basis. There it is. So I know that these are eigenvectors of the Hamiltonian, the definition, and they form a basis of the space. For instance, take the square well, infinite square well. I have the basis, sine, okay, going to zero. I can express any function that goes to zero in that thing in terms of those uh, elements. Take the periodic function in a certain interval. I have a Fourier basis, right? So these things, in some sense, should uh, ring you uh, things that you have already seen. Okay, but here I add the aspect that this is more general than what we saw. Any emission operator would do that. Okay. My question is uh, yeah. whether we have the general method to obtain the basis. Oh, no, 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 hard work and possibly impossible in most cases to take a very complex 
operator, find the eigen state. I mean, suppose that I give you a Hamiltonian, you don't know how to solve it. Find the basis. Sorry, I don't know how to do this. Okay? <laughs> suppose that I give you a matrix that is 30 by 30 to diagonalize, and I don't let you use any computer. Okay? <laughs> how would you do it? <laughs> okay. It's very hard, right? So with the computer, I mean, a uh, certain number of operations can be done, and you, you can do it. But otherwise, suppose that this operator is an infinite dimensional operator, well, unless it's particularly simple, exactly solvable, otherwise you're done. I mean, no way to do it, okay? So don't think that everything can be done, okay? <laughs> a few things can be done, very few, okay? But more than what you can do, can be taught. Okay, you can think of more things that maybe they cannot practically be realized, but we'll see. Okay, so in principle, you can prove in mathematical uh, precise terms that a basis of eigenvectors exists. Okay, I'm not giving you the mathematical proof because it's delicate, especially in the infinite dimensional case. For a finite dimensional uh, object, so for a matrix, the fact that the emission finite dimensional matrix can be diagonalized is a fact of linear algebra. So if you take a good book of linear algebra, it would explain to you that not only symmetric matrices can be diagonalized. You have probably seen this for real symmetric matrices, okay? Also emission matrices, which have the property that they are almost symmetric, except that the element uh, across the diagonal is the star, okay? You realize from, by this property, that uh, if I have u j prime a uh, u j, okay, that's equal to u j a uh, u j prime star. Okay, so you see that this is the element of the matrix j prime j. This is the element j j prime. Okay, they are equal apart from the star. Okay, so you take a matrix, you look at it on the diagonal, it should have real elements in the off diagonal. Okay, in corresponding places when you exchange with the transpose, you should have a number complex and the star of it in the other position. Okay, you look at it and you say, This is an emission matrix. Okay, those matrices can be diagonalized. Okay, the eigenvectors of them. By the way, okay, let's prove a couple of simple properties behind the spectral theory. Again, not the full proof for okay. But suppose that I tell you, tell me this. I have an eigenvector Pn. Okay. So something that does this. Okay. Remember, eigenvectors are such that you apply the operator, you get the same state apart from a number. Okay. And this number is called the eigenvalue. All right. What are the eigenvalues? They are they real or complex? Question. This is my first question. They, are they must be real, right? Because you remember that if I take the scalar product with Pn of this object, what I get is An, right? Because Pn and Pn gives me one. And An is the diagonal element. And according to my Definition the diagonal elements of an emission operator must be real. Okay, so very nice. The eigenvalues of an emission operator are by necessity real. Good. Uh, there is a second simple property, which is also quite important, which is the following. <laughs> Suppose that I have two different eigenvalues. One is an and another is am different from am. Okay. This is associated to say a state tn. And this is associated to a state pn. Now you can prove that these two elements are orthogonal for sure. Okay. 
If the two eigenvalues are the same, it could be degenerate, then you cannot conclude. Okay, in principle, you have to construct the product of the normal groups that are degenerate. They don't come automatically. But if they are different, they are automatically orthogonal. And the proof is very, very, very simple. Okay. Let me just show this to you. Okay. Let's consider Pn, A, Pn. Okay. As you know, this is equal to the star of the reverse one. Okay. So if I subtract the reverse one star, what I get? This. Don't be afraid. I mean, these are the same, and therefore, if you subtract Z. Very good. Okay. The first object, however, you immediately notice that this was AN times PN, right? In this second thing, this is equal to AM times PN. Okay. So let's carry out the algebra. Okay. This is AN times. Phi n, phi n minus a m star, but a m is real, so a m times the star of phi n, phi n. So what is the star of phi n, phi n? Phi n, phi n. So these two things are the same. So these two things are a n minus a m times a common factor that is p m p m. Is it clear? And now the conclusion is simple. Zero is equal to a number that is different from zero because the two eigenvalues are different times the scalar product of the two eigenvectors. Okay. Therefore, the two eigenvectors should be orthogonal. Is it clear? Very, very simple. Huh? Okay. Good. This is for me enough for the time being and almost forever. Okay. When you think of uh, emission operators, they, are, they have a complete basis of eigenvectors. Now, in order to warn you about possible delicacies of the infinitely dimensional case, let me just give for you a very familiar example that we have already encountered to show that in some sense what I'm telling you is wrong. But in a very special sense it's wrong. It can be made sense of, but you must be uh, a mathematician of, I mean, uh, X somehow. You must do spectral theory in a mathematical uh, form rather than brutally as we did. Okay, so let me just give you a couple of simple examples that show you a very delicate aspect of the story. Let's return to our very nice friend, the momentum operators. Okay, so let me just. Uh, <clears throat> So the momentum operator, let's put H bar to one. I never do that usually, but I mean, in order to make our formula clear, let's put H bar to one. Okay, so the momentum operator is 1D minus I the derivative. Okay, and now I ask you so let's work with one dimensional functions. Uh, does this object has eigenvectors? You say yes, of course. I know that if I take pk of x equal to uh, the plane weights, uh, then p pk of x is equal to k times pk of x. I put h bar to one is equal to k. Look, this is an eigenvector, right? Now um, let's consider. Let's consider, for instance, the state, the Hilbert space, 
which I define in this way. Uh, all the psi, all right, all this function, P of X, function of X, X being real, right, or the real axis, such that the integral between minus infinity and plus infinity of psi X square is finite, so they are normalizable. Okay. Um, and I also, okay, I add, although it almost is automatic, but let me add the fact that the limit for X going to plus infinity of say the modulus of psi X is equal to zero and also to minus infinity. Okay. So the function decays to zero. Okay. In order to be normalized, let's say that there is no other escape, but you can think of many funny uh, things in which uh, maybe the function is uh, such that it's a bit strange. Okay, and strange functions can do strange things. Okay, it could be normalized only a certain level sense, and maybe do that. Okay, so I don't want to enter in this. For, for us, this is it. this. Is kind of a consequence of this, but for a mathematician, we might object. Ah, but okay, so let's put this extra thing. Good. This Hilbert space of functions mm -hmm. is a, a complex uh, linear vector space, very nice. Is P emission? So, this is my first question Is P an emission operator? Okay, so what I should verify is that I take a function P, I take the P, I take a function C, okay, two functions, and I want to verify if this is equal to the momentum operator acting on the function to the left times P. Okay, and if you remember, you can do that by integration by parts. Okay, what is the crucial hypothesis? Is that the function goes to zero so that the boundary term in the integration by part does not contribute, right? And it does, okay? Both function p and psi go to zero to plus infinity. Therefore, the integration by part works nicely, no boundary term, there it is. So p is emission, okay? On those functions. Does it have eigenvalues in the space? eigenvectors in the space. No, because the eigenvectors exist, but phi k, phi k does not belong to the Hilbert space. Okay, so it's a curious thing. The operator is an emission. It somehow possesses the basis, but it's not the basis of the state. The plane waves are simply states of which you can do Fourier transforms and things like this. But they are not belonging to the state. That's the reason why I use here complete basis in quotation marks. Again, even this delicate thing can be really made perfect. Okay. But it would need a little bit more of mathematics, and I don't really want. I mean, our physics intuition is enough for what I want. Okay. On the contrary, there are other cases where the same object. Not only is emission, but it also uh, possesses a basis in the space. Let me give you the second example. The second example is this. Okay, give me here. I define the space uh, H P. P stands for periodic, which is the space of function in a certain interval. Okay, so same thing. But such that, say, in the interval a and b of a certain length l, okay, so the integral exists. Okay. The square and hypothesis: the functions are periodic. Okay, so phi a equal to phi b. The value of the two extrema are the same. Okay, so same thing. I have now a finite element, a finite interval, okay? Functions that have 
uh, normalizable in this interval and periodic. Okay. Then you know that first of all, P is still emission because again the boundary term disappeared because of periodicity. The value of the integral in A and in P are the same. Try to verify, it makes sense of it. I mean, it's a one line, but you better write it. So due to this condition, again, the boundary term disappears, even if it doesn't go to zero, because they're the same. And when you take the difference, you go to zero. So P is emission again. Uh, does it have eigenvectors in the space? Yes, some plane waves do the job. Remember, the k, which are equal to 2 pi over L times n, the ones that satisfy the periodic boundary conditions are periodic functions. Okay, so they precisely observe this part. Okay, so they belong to the space. So you see that the same object, depending on where you consider it as an operator, it could have a different answer. It's always emission, but sometimes they have legitimate eigenvectors in this space. Sometimes they only unofficial eigenvectors. Okay, good. Let's stop this story here. So for us, emission operators have. Uh, a complete set of uh, eigenvectors and the associated eigenvalue are real and eigenvectors with uh, different eigenvalue are orthogonal. Good. This is enough for the time being. Uh, now, <clears throat> let me just um, Let's one piece of formalism that we will often use, and this is probably the right moment to introduce it. Okay. So I will talk about projection of an image. Let's look again at the expression we wrote before. Pn, given any basis Pn, you could write it as the sum over all elements of the basis of a, a, a number, which I will call psi n. And if you remember, psi n can be calculated by taking the uh, matrix element of the vector psi, if you want, with the element of the basis. Okay? This you remember, right? Which we said a while ago. Good. Let's let's insert this in here and rewrite this in the following way: sum over n. Then I write this first, so p n. Then I write this element here in this form. P n. Okay. So remarkable. Psi is equal to some object, okay, applied to psi. So what is this object here doing? Let's look at it. It's Pn, Pn. Now you might think, oh, what a strange object. There is a cat on the right and the bra on the left. What it is, when I write something like this, a bra is ready to accept the vector. So in some sense, this is an operator. If it accepts a vector, it produces a vector, right? So it's an operator. But when you sum over all n, and these are orthonormal elements of the basis, of a basis, the action of this object, of this operator on a stage, is equal to the identity. Okay? So if you take any orthonormal, say, Pn, and you form the sum of all elements of cat bra of the element of the basis, the result is one identity. Okay, this is a very nice thing. But now let's uh, do one little thing more. So let me do, you look at this object, okay? You are writing the sum, the psi as the sum over all elements of the basis of the component along the direction Pn, okay? 
So let me define this object here to be the projector operator acting on psi. In other words, the projector operator acting on psi produces for me a state that goes in the direction n, which is the symbol that I use there, with uh, the corresponding component. Okay, so this is again in three dimensions. Think of a vector v. Think of the three elements of the basis. A projection, okay, is simply telling me the direction x, for instance, uh, the uh, how, how much you get of x, how much you get of y, and so forth. Okay, so uh, essentially the three components with the amplitudes along the three axes. Okay, good. Uh, okay, now this is a definition. Obviously, you realize immediately mm. that uh, uh, if I project an operator, a, a vector, and I apply it twice, okay, let's see what it is. This is equal to Pn with Pn applied to the side. But this is equal to Pn times side n Pn. Okay, how do you project an element that is already only in the direction n? Well, it's the same thing, right? So this is equal to Pn. Okay, so projecting twice is totally equivalent to projecting once. In other words, if I have projected, I repeat the operation, it's already done. Okay, so projectors are uh, uh, therefore even problem. Okay, so if you project twice, uh, nothing happens. So p square of n coincides with p n. Okay, this is in some sense a defining process, the property of projectors. Projectors are permission operators, you can prove their emission, uh, such that if you project twice, p square is equal to p. Uh, one of the exercises to show that the p n is emission. It's a very simple thing, but try to do it. Very good. Now, let's try to make sense in this funny notation. Okay, what is Pn? I want to prove to you that Pn, you can write it in this funny cat bra notation in the following way Pn is equal to Pn. Pn. Okay, let's see. Let's operate on this object with an element psi. Now, according to this way of writing, this is a bra that waits for a vector, okay? So let's make it happy. There comes the vector. Okay. And Pn applies to it. But what is this? Psi n is the component of the state on the direction n by definition. So this is psi n. Yeah. And what I told you that the definition of projector was precisely that. Okay, so in some sense, this makes sense of writing projectors in terms of k and bra of the same element. Okay, and this also immediately tells you that this object is the sum over n of the projector n. In other words, you can write the identity as a sum of projector on all elements of the basis. Okay? This thing is very, very useful. Sometimes you insert identities here and there. It is called resolution of the identity. Okay? Very handy in calculation. You have something you don't know how to manage, Say, let me consider that there is an identity there which I wrote, which I write in this particular basis that I like. Say, I can do that in precisely this form, and I carry on with the calculation, and maybe some simple thing comes out. Okay, so please think of this as a useful, very useful uh, trick. Okay, good. For us, it's enough for the time being, projectors, we will return to them when we will do measurement in quantum mechanics. But for the time being, 
I would be uh, happy with it. Okay. There is only one last thing that I want to do at this stage, which is the question about the generalities. Uh, no, let me first do one more thing, which is the following. You see that if this is the expression of psi, uh, then so no. If psi is given by that expression, the fact that psi is normalized, okay, can be proven in one line that it implies that the sum over n of the component square summed over all n should be equal to one. Proof. Right here, this as sum over n, pn. Uh, okay, then I have here a uh, sum over n prime. Remember, this is psi n prime star p n prime, right? I'll take the star product of this. You see that I have a zeta function of n prime in n, okay? And the result is therefore that there is a single sum over n. Is it clear? Try to do it, okay? And you get this. Okay, so the fact that the function is normalizing implies that the sum of the square of the components on all elements of the basis is one. Okay, this perhaps would suggest an analogy to you with the famous psi x modulus square equal to one. The only difference is that here I have in principle discrete sum of components, and here I have an integral. Okay, so you could think of psi x modulus square a little bit huh, as, as indeed we will make sense of it in this way, as the element of the state psi uh, in the direction x, where these are position agents. More about this in a short while. Okay, so the psi x. Okay, is in a sense to be identified with the so the wave function with the scalar product of the psi with the x, where these are uh, the bra associated to the position eigenstates. Now, position eigenstates are strange and funny, precisely in the same way as plane waves are strange and funny okay because in some sense they do not belong to the natural universe space what are position eigenstates by the way you take the position operator okay you want to uh, apply to this position eigenstate and you pretend that the result is an eigenstate okay so are those objects which somehow realize the identity of the eigenvalue. Okay, in one D, if you want to get rid of the X, this is the equation. Okay. Now these are strange things. I will see in a second. If you try to calculate the scalar product of two position eigenstates, you do not get a Kronecker delta. You get a Dirac delta. Mm? So in some sense they are not normalizable as well as the play waves. Very, very similar. And they are a continuum. Okay. You see, there is a continuum of X as the K in the plane. So they are strange. They imply that sums are transformed into integrals. They imply that Kronecker delta are transformed into Dirac delta. But otherwise, they play a very similar role to what we saw so far. Okay. Good. Let me take a break from a little bit from this uh, uh, funny uh, position and momentum in the state and the funny things of the continuum, just to um, relax a little bit and return, return to uh, so we'll get back to this in uh, probably, I don't know, 10 minutes. Because I want to finish today. Explain to you position and 
momentum and get fixed in a better way. But before that, let me give you one important, useful theorem about two commuting, two commuting Hermitian uh, operators, say A and B, both Hermitian, but uh, their commutator is zero. Okay? They have a very, very interesting problem, which is the following that you can certainly you can find a basis of eigenvectors, say, of A, let's call them Pm. Okay? So such that a P M is equal to A M P M, right? I put the label A here to denote that these are the eigenvectors of A. Okay. Second, B is a mission. Therefore, I can find a basis of eigenvectors of B. So some elements P, which I have to label with the B, then principal difference of rules such that. This is equal to B and P B M. Is it clear? A M and B M are real numbers. They are the eigenvalues of A and the eigenvalues of B. Right? And collectively, they form what is called the spectrum of the eigenvalues of A and the eigenvalues of B. Okay. Now the theorem says that if the two operators commute, then I can find a basis of eigenvectors which is common to both. Okay, so I make them both happy with a single basis, not with two separate. Okay, a single one appropriately constructed is enough to uh, make both happy. The crucial element, okay, is the following the proof again, in principle, in the notes you find more details. But the proof is more elaborate, but the crucial idea behind is the following. Suppose that I have a, 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 an element of, of this object, okay? So this is an eigenvector of A. I apply B to it, and I ask you, is this still an eigenvector of A or not? In principle, you might disrupt it completely. Okay, you have a nice vector, eigenvector of A, you apply B, oh, disaster. Okay. Nicely enough, if the two operators commute and they apply A, what happens? This is equal to <clears throat> um, uh, B A. Okay. And this is uh, equal to uh, P uh, A M. Okay, this object is by definition A M P A M. Okay, so I can rewrite this as A M. I can take it out of the operator because these are linear operators times B P A M. Okay. Now look at the parentheses that I put to highlight the fact that here I have a vector, here I have the same vector, and A acting on this vector produces an eigenvalue, the same, AM. Okay, so I started from an eigenvalue AM, I applied B, and I still get an eigenvalue of A with the same eigenvalue. So there are two possibilities. The simple one, which I tell you immediately, is that AM was non-degenerate. There was a single vector, okay, with eigenvalue a m. Then immediately confused to non-degenerate a. Then immediately concluded b c a of m must be proportional to uh, this object, okay? Because there are no no other. Uh, eigenvalues with the same operator. Okay, proportion to this with some number. Let me call the number B M. Okay, you're done. This is also an eigenvector of B. 
with in principle a different eigenvalue. The eigenvalue does not have to be the same, but the basis is the same. Okay. More complicated is the degenerate case. So there are more than one vectors of A with precisely the same eigenvalue. So in principle, when I say something like this, I should really add here some index I, okay, and say that there are many of them. I goes from uh, one to some uh, index which I call uh, G A. Uh, what is it? Uh, depending on the M, so G A M. Okay, so some number three, seven, whatever. It depends on A and it depends on the A value M I'm looking at. Okay, some number. Several of them, they are all degenerate in the same way. You can have that situation, which means the following. It means that, um, I will see. If I represent the matrix A in the basis of this eigenvectors, can you tell me what uh, form the matrix will have? So this is now the matrix. Okay, I write it. I will have blocks, so it's full of zeros. If the eigenvalue is, for instance, uh, one dimensional, say that the first is one dimensional. I have here a one by one matrix A1. And here I have zero everywhere. Zero everywhere. Suppose that the second eigenvalue is two dimensional. Then I have a block which is two by two. And here I have A2, A2, zero, zero, and zero everywhere. Okay? Is it clear? Suppose that the third one is one dimensional. Okay, then I have A3 and then zero everywhere. Okay, suppose that the fourth one is three dimensional. I don't know. I'm just inventing numbers. So A4, A4, A4. Okay, zero, 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 zero. Okay, and then all zeros everywhere. And so on so forth. This is called. A matrix in block form. Okay, so the eigenvalues, the degenerate eigenvalue, the node for you uh, elements, okay, of pieces of the Hilbert space, okay, where somehow the eigenvalues is the same. If I take two elements in this space, okay, so for instance, uh, I can call this P41 uh, of A and P42. Way and I mix them in the way I want, so with the some alpha and beta. This is still an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue A4. You realize, okay, because I start from two degenerate eigenvectors, I rotate them and they are still eigenvectors with the same A4. Okay, so in some sense, I'm writing uh, very simple matrices like this, but in principle, if I change the basis. With any possible mixture of this choice that I made, the matrix remains the same. However, let's now look at the matrix for B. Okay, I should write it in a different color. The color is not there. Okay, so I will use, yeah. Can you reiterate from the beginning? Now. Which which case? Uh, the non degenerate is clear, right? Uh, yeah. The degenerate case, I haven't explained it yet. So from the beginning is now. <laughs> okay. I'm starting to prepare the explanation. I start from A. And I say A is degenerate, means that there is an extra index here. And there are blocks of eigenvalues that are the same. Depending on the eigenvalue, it could be non degenerate, twice degenerate. Of the general three times the general seven times the general okay blocks of eigenvectors that are repeated and I have to use an extra index i to distinguish the different eigenvectors is it clear this is the only thing that I have so far written and then I have written the matrix 
with blocks of the general derivatives. Okay, good. Now comes the interesting part, which is this. The proof that I gave to you works up to here. Okay, I'm not allowed to conclude that there is a single vector and therefore this object here must be proportional to the object I started from. This is not possible in general. Although you might say, what about this element, the phi one? There is only one vector. So the matrix for B here would have some element B1. Okay. What about this? No worries. Here there should be some element, whatever. Let's call it B3, some number. Okay. Very good. But what about the matrix here for B? It's a mess. What I'm telling you is that the application of B to any of those states is still in the same space. It's an eigenvector with the same eigenvalue. But in principle, the matrix for B, let me just use this, is a full two by two matrix. Okay. What about the matrix for B here? Oh, complex. Full three by three matrix. Okay. So any subspace that is not uh, that is degenerate, in principle, the matrix of B there is complex, it's full of numbers. So this is still not the basis of eigenvectors, right? You realize it is sometimes a basis of eigenvector for the non degenerate plane, and so the degenerate flow is full of things. But, but then the trick is the following these are finite dimensional matrices, emission matrices. They can be diagonalized. You can find the exact right combination of the original basis state of A, which makes B happy again. Okay. And this particular combination of basis states obviously leaves A totally happy as before, because any combination of these three states, okay, is still eigenvectors with A plus, A4, A4. So you can do whatever you want. But for B, uh, it makes a difference from having just a matrix a three by three block full of numbers or having a nice uh, a nice a three by three thing with three eigenvectors uh, which are some uh, b7 uh, b 19 okay three numbers in other words here let's, let's forget about that and then zero 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 is it clear so I have to do something, which is to in, uh, find the appropriate combination of the original state of A, which makes B better. Uh, which means I take my computer, I put the three by three matrix, I ask Google, please diagonalize this matrix, and they will give me the coefficient. Wolfram Alpha does it for very small matrices in a simple way. Okay, you don't even need to have mathematics. Hmm? If you have mathematics, you can do it for larger than Yeah. I give two examples. Just just to make it. Yeah. It would be hard to draw 17 dimensional matrices. Okay. So I do two and three just to give you a flavor of a uh, degenerate situation. Okay. This is the behind the theorem. Okay. So it's not a full proof. Uh, the mathematician would be happy. But I mean, you can find it in this basically based on this. I'll give you the idea. Okay, good. Uh, now let's do the final part. Okay, which I promise, which is position and momentum and your state in a better final form. Okay. We will use this. Uh, um, several times later on. And in particular, it suggests the fact that if I have two operators that commute, and one of this is, for instance, the Hamiltonian, and the other is something, for instance, the parity operator. The operator given a function gives me the function at minus seven, okay? Right, the parity operator, uh, psi, of x is equal to psi of minus x. Okay, this is a, an operator, it's an initial operator. Uh, 
it has eigenvectors, by the way, the even eigenvalue, the even functions are eigenvectors with eigenvalue plus one. The odd functions are eigenvectors with eigenvalues minus one. Okay. Now, if the Hamiltonian commutes with the parity operator, then you know that you can find a common basis of the eigenvector for both, which means that you can find even and odd functions of the Hamiltonian, which we have already used, right? Which for a minute. For the harmonic oscillator, for instance, also, right? So it's uh, even or odd. Ground state, first expansion. Okay, so these things are already there in some of our previous lectures, but I wanted to make them formally more uh, clearly stated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so final part. I told you, let's work with the one dimensional things. So X position in this case are subset. So, so things we'll try to make sense of such that they realize this eigenvalue equation. Okay. And similarly, the momentum eigen states uh, K are such that if you apply the operator to it, you get like there is in principle H bar K here. But if you put H bar to one, you can get rid of the K in this sequence in uh, object. Okay, good. Now, as I told you, given an element of the basis, you can form a projector operator. Okay, so the projector operator labeled by now this continuous variable X, not N, but X is a continuous label. Okay, is such that if you take any state, okay, you find the component on the element X. Okay, so you find, uh, say, X times times what? Times what we previously called psi of x, right? Or we also called it in a different way. We called it psi of x in this way. The wave function is what appears there, okay? And indeed, it's very simple to show that this has to be equal to x, right? Is the projection of psi on the eigenvalue of eigenvector x. Is it clear? Hmm? So this is the projection operator written in terms of this continuous variable position of the bar. Okay, pretty much what we did in the discrete case. You remember that sum over n of Pn was equal to the identity. What becomes of this if I have a continuous variable? Integral dx of this position in the state uh, projector x hmm, equal to the identity. You remember that there was also a good way of writing the projector as cat and bra. Okay, so indeed, indeed, if you write it this way, you immediately see that this object is telling me that this is equal to. Uh, you see x times uh, sorry x psi. Okay, so you, you see it makes perfect sense in this field. Okay, uh, you better uh, sit down and stare at those things. I mean, I just go a bit uh, fast now because we are towards the end. But uh, if you just think of a moment, you will realize that these are familiar. Uh, object. Okay, good. So the fact that this is an identity, which you can write equivalently as integral over dx of xx, okay, equal to one, means, for instance, that you would write just to let's let's do the following. Suppose that I ask you to, to calculate what is the uh, k K prime object. Okay. Uh, no, first let's do the following. What is the um, eigen function uh, associated to the uh, K element? Okay. This is the uh, plane waves, right? So 
this object here is a wave function of the plane wave, so e to the i k n. Let's put a factor square root of two pi. Okay. We see that you know, this is useful for the normalization of the arc. Hmm? Okay, good. Now, suppose that I ask you, let's calculate the um, uh, overlap between two plane waves. Then you might say, okay, let me just insert here the identity. Okay. And I write the identity in terms of x. Okay, so this is significant in dx of k x x k prime okay but this object i know what it is right it is e to the i k prime x so what is this is the star of e to the i k x so e to the minus i k x okay so the result is integral in dx of e to the i k prime minus k x well almost divided by two pi okay now you remember that we made sense of this okay as a limit the limit in which you take this from minus l to l and you take l going to infinity and this is the delta of k prime minus k go back and look at this uh Equation that we wrote a while ago. Okay, so in some sense, these states are strange in the sense that their overlap is not chronic at delta of k and k prime, but rather the arc delta of k prime minus k. And in a very similar spirit, you can prove that these states here are also giving you a Dirac delta. Okay, look in the notes. Practice a little bit with you, get some familiarity. Final thing that I want to show is the following. Still playing with this ingredient. Suppose that I uh, ask you, please calculate for me the wave function in momentum space, which is the component of psi on the uh, plane wave curve. Hmm? Well, then you might say, okay. Let me just insert an identity here. And I write the identity in terms of x as here. So this is equal to the integral in dx of k x x tab. Is it k so far? Good. Let's use the rules. Equal. What is this? One over square root of two pi times e to the minus i k x. Remember that the wave function of the plane waves. Huh? Yeah. 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 Good. What is this? Is the wave function associated to psi in real space? Psi x. Okay. So this object is equal to the integral over dx of uh, e to the minus i k x times psi of x divided by square root of 2 pi. What is this? The Fourier transform. Okay. So this object is, I would call it pi with a half, but don't think of this as a, as a, in a Fourier transform at momentum k of the original function of Okay. But I mean, we physicists define the Fourier transform actually uh, without this factor, so it's one over square root of two pi. The Fourier transform for a mathematician, a symmetric uh, square root of two pi is even better. Okay, and in the same spirit, I can use the identity uh, for the uh, k, which I, I can write a similar. Insertion of identity one equal to the integral over k of k k. Okay, you can do that. And if I ask you, okay, please calculate for me similar exercise x psi, which is the psi x, right? Well, you insert the identity, you do very, very similar uh, uh, things, and you 
the use that so this is dk to pi e to the i k x uh, side. Okay. In other words, the Fourier transform transform back gives you psi like this is the inverse Fourier transform um, formula. Okay. So Fourier transform and inverse Fourier transform are immediately obtained by just the tricks of inserting identities written in terms of position eigenstates or momentum eigenstates with the appropriate definition that these objects are on the continuum and they are normalized with the uh, director. Okay. What? No, there is a square root from here. And another square root because I defined the Fourier transform without the square root. Okay, so uh, this is definition dependent. Depending on how where you put the square roots, you get one or the other. This is Pitt's definition. Okay, for which the Fourier transform is integral the x without square, without ties, and the inverse Fourier transform has the full two pi there. Mathematicians like more square root to square root, okay? Because they are more symmetric. Okay, I think we are now uh, done. We are tired. And, uh, so I would uh, stop the uh, lecture here. Okay, so, so uh, this, this was a bit formal, but we wanted to kind of give you now flavor of what it means to have a formula of quantum mechanics. What are the possible complications? You realize they are related to continuous spectrum, uh, non-normalizable functions, things that don't give you simple chronic deltas. Okay, all these things are delicate mathematically. For us, I mean, we use uh, as a piece of cake, okay? And it usually works. I mean, if someone comes with a very, very tricky question of mathematics, then we might be in danger, okay? For finite dimensional cases, that's it, okay? It's a theory of finite dimensional matches on C and complex number to the A. By the way, all of quantum information, okay, you have heard of quantum information. You can essentially think of quantum information manipulation as working with finite dimensional things because they work on few bits. And qubits are two by two objects, spin, spin one time, okay? So the whole of quantum information came in, is indeed an exercise of complex linear algebra. Quantum mechanics seen, seen as a complex linear algebra exercise, okay? Good. Okay. So next week, bye bye. Yeah. Yeah.